All right, I want to tell you about biodiversity. I think you guys are all there in France uh, talking about biodiversity. So I want to talk about the legal side of biodiversity. Um, first of all, this building, as boring as it might look here in northern Germany, is the home to 80% of all known and formally described bacterial diversity. This is the Leibniz Institute DSMZ, which is the German collection for microorganisms and cell cultures. We send and ship about um, 40,000 items of microbial diversity around the world to 10,000 customers in 86 countries, about two thirds of which are international and um, two thirds are academic, about a third that are from industry. We're the first registered collection under the EU law implementing the Nagoya Protocol because of this massive sort of international traffic in biodiversity. So as a result, we have uh, followed this world of international rules about around what is fair and right to do with biodiversity for a number of years. And I'm going to try to walk you through in a very fast and um, shallow way what that, those rules are. First of all, I probably do not need to tell this crowd that biodiversity loss is a global problem. So here's nine different worldviews on different kinds of measurable biodiversity loss. And no matter how you look at it, you can see it's a global problem. Meaning if you want to make progress on biodiversity loss, you have to make deals at the global level. And the way that we do that in the world that we live in is through the United Nations process. This means it has to be both an international agreement and political will that reaches across many different types of economic and social situations. Where this kind of all begins is in 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, in which three legally binding agreements were first opened for signature. One is the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is what I will focus on today. And I often say jokingly in talks, this is kind of the bastard stepchild, because as many of you have followed in the newspapers probably noticed, it is the second treaty that everybody knows around. It's the one that, uh, that just happened in Sharm el-Sheikh, and that's the Climate Change Convention. Perhaps equally less known as the CBD is the Convention to Combat Desertification, but all three of these are the way that we are trying to deal with the largest environmental challenges of our time. So the CBD basically has three goals, um, and one big absent partner, which is the United States of America, um, and those three goals, uh, this is the problem with the PDF conversion. Um, so behind this world map were the three goals of the, of the biodiversity, which is number one, the conservation of biological diversity, number two, the sustainable use of its parts, and number three, the fair and equitable benefits sharing of benefits arising from that diversity. That third one sounds so clunky in my mouth, not because of the cough drop, but actually because it doesn't really make sense as a biologist looking at it, perhaps, because what does fair and equitable benefit sharing have to do with anything? Well, it was the political balancing act in order to convince all parties of the world to conserve their biological diversity, to sustainably develop to incentivize those first two things, they there was a promise of green gold made that there would be benefit sharing from biodiversity, meaning scientists that came and used biodiversity from those countries' borders, those countries would have the right to ask for benefits, monetary and non-monetary, back from their diversity. And this would help to create a sort of positive feedback loop for conserving and sustainably using that biodiversity. After the CBD was negotiated in 1992, the trends on biodiversity loss continued. So you can see these the living planet index here. And basically, no matter what line you look at, be it green or pink or orange, purple and blue, the line, the trend line continues to go down, meaning there was further work done. And in fact, there was a need to make regional commitments, especially where in the South, biodiversity loss was growing at an alarming rate. And so what was structured um, was a new strategic plan for biodiversity. At the same time, that third objective, the fair and equitable benefit sharing piece, was seen by many to be an unfulfilled promise of the 1992 agreement. And so the front page article of an NGO newspaper sort of said, biopiracy, this is the big problem. We need better rules, better clarity on how benefit sharing is supposed to take place. And so the confluence of those two issues, needing to address regional challenges and to further refine the rules on benefit sharing, led 
to a 2010 agreement and basically to a political trade-off. We call it in, in, in German Kuhhandel um, and in English horse trading between the Nagoya Protocol focusing on the third objective and the IG targets focusing on the first two objectives. <clears throat> the IG targets try to do much more targeted um, addressing of biodiversity loss and the Nagoya Protocol comes into existence and is supposed to provide legal certainty for the actors involved in the use and international exchange of genetic resources and traditional knowledge. It was supposed to lay out how the sharing of benefits would take place Genetic resources were defined as plants, animal, fungi, microbes, including biochemical compounds found in those, including DNA and RNA, importantly, as the material itself. Users, both commercial and non-commercial, are included in the Nagoya Protocol. So an important note here for any of you listening, if you're doing field work and going into a country, including here inside Europe, you should be aware of the Nagoya Protocol and figure out whether or not you have access and benefit sharing leg legislations and need a Nagoya type permit to be able to conduct research legally with material you collect abroad. I should note that Germany does not have any access regulations on its material, but France does, Spain does, Croatia does, and a number of other countries here in Europe, as well as many in the South. So the procedure for complying with the Nagoya Protocol is a bit complex. First, you need to determine whether or not you're in the legal scope of access and benefit sharing rules. You do this by identifying the authorities via the ABS Clearinghouse, which is an online website that will tell you, in theory, whether or not that country has rules or not. Then you would develop one or multiple different documents that could have the names PIC or MAT or other documents, depending on the country. Then you collect your sampling. Many institutions will also require a material transfer agreement to transfer from a university, for example, collaborator to back to Germany or to a country here in Europe. And then often there are reporting requirements that then take place. Importantly, um, as a collection during our process of becoming the first registered collection here in the EU, we wrote to every single country listed in the ABS Clearinghouse, and we asked them, how can we legally accept a microbial deposit here in our public collection from your country? And the disappointing thing is that the vast majority of countries, as you can see here in the second column, did not answer. So over half of the countries, and it's of course getting better over time, simply did not answer our email. The answer rate is improving. Unfortunately, so is the invalidation of some of the emails because people haven't email updated their email address in the clearinghouse. And there are many that politely responded and said, yeah, we'll get back to you and we're still waiting. Meaning that this sort of bilateral process of one country, one scientist and a back and forth is a really difficult process often to navigate. In the EU, as I already mentioned, Access is not regulated at the international European Union level, but at the individual country level. But compliance is regulated under the EU Regulation 511-2014. In Germany, you can be checked by our national competent authority, which is the Bundesamt für Naturschutz, so the Federal Agency for Nature Conservation. And in Germany, in the academic sector, as well as in the commercial sector, there have already been checks underway, many including in the biodiversity research space, in which you have to provide evidence that you have complied with ABS laws in any countries that your institute has been working in. So, is that all? Is that all there is? Not really. As the title indicated for the talk, the question that is now in the room is what to do about online data, online biodiversity data. And what I'd like to talk about here is the GBF. So as probably most of you are aware, the state of environmental decline continues. And what has been happening in the climate change space is that quantitative indicators have been in place for about the last five or 10 years and that has caught the attention of the CBD world. And so the goal here in the biodiversity space is to now try to get quantitative indicators agreed to at the international level. And this has taken place in the context of a document called the Global Biodiversity Framework and will replace the now expired AICHI targets. 
This process has been massively delayed by the pandemic and parties will finally now meet in December in Montreal, um, uh, two years and three months um, later than they were originally scheduled to meet. G the, the question of whether or not DSI, which is uh, digital sequence information or sequence data resulting from the access of biodiversity in the world should require benefit sharing or not, has legally been linked to the GBF decision process. This means that there is a dependency between this global nature deal and the third objective of benefit sharing in general, and particularly the question around digital data. So the process looks like this. For the last... Um, gosh, six years, there has been a question on whether or not this should happen. It was raised first in Cancun, Mexico at COP13. It came up again in COP14 in Sharm El Sheikh. And that is where DSI was tied to the open-ended working group for the Global Biodiversity Framework, meaning it created a linkage between the two, meaning that if one was agreed to, there would be sort of a political pressure put upon the other one. And as I just mentioned, there's a lot of expectation for the meeting next month taking place in Montreal. Why is this happening now? As scientists, it's important to look back at sort of the quantitative data that triggers these policy moments. And that is really um, two main factors that have created this. Number one is the explosion in DNA sequencing data since the agreement to the Nagoya Protocol. So it was negotiated back in 2010. And of course there was, there were open access sequence databases back then. GenBank already existed, ENA, DDBJ, et cetera. But the exponential growth becomes really robust over the past 12 years. And this has not um, gone without notice in the policy sector. On top of that, big agreements or big prizes like the Nobel Prize in Medicine back in 2020, which created a lot of visibility around the ability to target and to specifically manipulate DNA sequences in silico, <coughs> sorry, in vitro or in vivo, um, as well as the expanding toolkit of synthetic biologists. So this table here on the, on the left, you don't necessarily need to read, but on the left are sort of a list of all of the different tools that we now have in our toolkit of synthetic biology. And the amount of stars is how good we are at doing this in different types of um, model organisms. So when you take these two factors into account, lots of data in the databases, lots of good tools for doing in-lab work, the necessity for going out into the field and asking for permission from provider countries via the Nagoya Protocol has fundamentally offered. Now, I'm not saying that people don't go into the field anymore but fundamentally the shift towards a more um, in silico based type of biology work is happening and will continue to happen. On top of this, DSI itself is such a big data field. Now I'll actually just in the interest of time go through these quickly, but it's in the millions of billions, it's thousands of databases, millions of users, hundreds of millions of sequences and a huge amount listed in the open access literature. So taken together, this gives the policy community a real dilemma. DSI creates a loophole in the, in, in the Nagoya Protocol on the one hand, but the Nagoya Protocol regulatory framework of asking for a single permit for a single use, when we're talking about hundreds of millions and tens of millions of users, doesn't fit, right? So the solution offered by the legal framework that exists right now doesn't fit for the big data field that we that we have before us. So the other thing that my group here at the DSMZ has been working on are trying to understand and communicate to policymakers exactly what is at stake and how important the use of sequence data is for all of us, um, including for researchers in the developing world. So we focus a lot of our work taking advantage of the country field, which exists in open access uh, sequence databases to acknowledge the country of origin that provides access to genetic resources. I say, I highlight this here because many people get confused about the data that I'm now going to show, thinking that I'm talking about where something was sequenced and I'm actually talking about where it was collected, the actual country of origin for the physical sample before the sequencing took place. 
Um, uh, this is the PDF problem. Um, okay, well, this was a highlighted or this was a um, animated slide that basically showed you the methods that we've applied. So we've taken um, several hundred thousand open access publications that cite the use of sequence data. And we've asked where were the authors located, what country they were located in. So in this case, this publication was a, a viral um, a new viral outbreak, and that author was located in Peru. And then the sequences that were listed in the publication actually came physically from, or the, the, the genetic resource, the virus came from Brazil. So in this example, you would have the providing country as Brazil and the using country as Peru. <coughs> and what we've been able to do is to go through and do this for millions of sequences for hundreds of thousands of publication and show countries, for example, I showed this to Colombian negotiators several weeks ago, that Colombian scientists are using DSI from 75 countries and that Colombian genetic resources based DSI is being used by 56 countries. Importantly here, trying to convince and to explain that Every country is a user and a provider. In the world of the CBD, many countries, particularly low or middle income countries, see themselves as only providers and forget about their users and their scientists in country. So um, using these methods, we were able to sort of show again who the top users and providers of DSI are. Um, big countries, of course, prof no surprise, like the United States, can, uh, China, Canada, Japan, actually are responsible for over 50% of the data that's available in these open access databases. Countries um, like Brazil, high mega biodiversity countries like Brazil and India are also in this top use. And I also like to point out that the blue and the purple columns of providing and of using tend to, to kind of go hand in hand. Now you do see trends like Germany providing less and using more compared to, for example, India. So this relationship of provider-user does exist, but absolutes don't exist. You don't see countries that absolutely don't provide and use. Now, the one example, of course, are the high seas out in the international waters. You don't see any purple because as far as we know, there are no um, uh, people living out at um, uh, 3,000 miles offshore. Um, which is the definition of international waters. Um, but indeed, the, the, the trend is, is that all countries use and provide. And this is sort of further illustrated by uh, this graph, again, another problem of the, the PDF version of my talk, um, that you basically don't see any um, uh, points up here. There are no countries that are only providing DSI, and there are no countries that are only using DSI. In fact, it's a relatively linear trend for countries between providing and using. Now, this is not to say that the world is fair, that the capacity is to use and to scientifically analyze DSI is the same across the world, but this is sort of to provide um, empirical evidence to the policy process about how important it is to consider sort of both sides of the coin. Another thing that we, we looked at was to, to break these trends into very, very oversimplified data buckets. <clears throat> so OECD is are, are, tend to be high income countries. G77 tends to be um, low income countries. And then BRICS tend to be middle income countries. And we're basically able to show with this graph that DSI users use their own DSI more than foreign DSI. And that um, there are still inequalities, that there are 40% fewer DSI based publications um, from low and middle income country scientists than there are from high income country scientists. I found this article after the Geneva negotiations really important um, on why, on understanding from a scientific perspective, why DSI is likely to be part of the deal making taking place in Montreal next month. This simple statement from the lead African negotiator, from an African point of view, we will not accept the adoption of the global biodiversity framework without agreement on DSI. It's an outcome too horrible to contemplate, but if that's what we need to do, then that's what we will do meaning it might not matter if it makes sense, if it's fair. Um, this political choice will be made in the context of the larger global biodiversity framework. And the question is how we can avert damage on that. I know that Juliana is getting nervous here, but I will just wrap it up. If you'd like to know what the major issues are that are being called for by the scientific community, I encourage you to check out this open letter from the DSI Scientific Network 
We are calling for a multilateral open access solution to DSI benefit sharing concerns. And you can still sign the open letter if you would like to. We also had a publication coming out in Nature Communications earlier this year that really explained or proposed a new way to consider benefit sharing from DSI to create a positive feedback loop rather than a penalty-based um, policy outcome. And again, I can put that link in the chat if you'd like. But the five main ideas here in this benefit sharing solution are quite simple probably for this community to understand. Open access, simplicity, a harmonization across multiple different UN fora that are handling this issue, a positive feedback loop that recognizes sovereign rights but still strengthens the use of DSI in low and middle income countries, LMICs, and a fairness and transparency um, aspect in which the DSI databases can provide information on what's coming into the databases but are not used as DSI police in figuring out who is using what. With that, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here, for listening, and um, hope that we can get into better discussions or deeper discussions in the next few minutes.